Hi, <laughs> I believe we are now live. So uh, welcome to tonight's chat with Drink Book Authors, sponsored by Beverage. Uh, you can find the website at beverage.co if you're not already able to click the link wherever you're viewing this video. Uh, Beverage is a company that uh, they produce the Whiskey Live uh, tasting events in the U United States and Canada. And they also produce a whiskey or, and other spirits tasting kits, the first of which was an American single malt kit, a very hot topic right now. And uh, they also host these chats with people from the world of drinks. Uh, we took a little pause in the chats for uh, the organization to throw Whiskey Live, but now the chats are back and they should be streaming pretty much every week as far as I know. Uh, the topics have covered everything from investing in whiskey to, uh, to cocktail history to uh, information about bitters that got really nerdy a few weeks back. And tonight we are here to talk about drink books. And we have three drink book authors, myself included, here for the chat. So um, may as well bring my co-authors on screen whenever you're ready to do that. But my, my name is Camper English, and I'm the author of Doctors and Distillers, The Remarkable Medicinal History of Beer, Wine, Spirits, and Cocktails. And we have also with us Amanda Schuster, who is Hello. coming on screen now. The author of me. two books so far on uh, drinking in New York City. There you are. You, you were yep. on the little spinning wheel for a while. And now you've showed up live. <laughs> <laughs> Life. <laughs> uh, welcome, Amanda. And our third panelist for the evening is Emma Jansen, the author of three books, uh, Mescal, The Bartender's Manifesto, and The Way of the Cocktail. Uh, those later two books are co-authored with famous bartenders. And between us all, we have a big stack of books. So <laughs> I uh, thank you uh, both for joining me here for this talk. And thanks to everyone who's watching live or who watches later. You know, thanks in advance. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to talk about drink books and our books a little bit and other people's drink books. And we'd be delighted to get questions uh, to answer. I believe we can see those in our little chat room. And uh, we can take this conversation kind of wherever we want to go. I have some questions written down. But uh, if we get some interesting topics suggested, then we'll go for it. Because why not? We're, we're all here to sip a little sip and uh, have a little fun. Um, <laughs> Cheers. Okay. <laughs> so uh, to get started, we'll each introduce ourselves and then we'll do a round where we'll introduce the books that we've written um, that have come out. Uh, all of us have books that have come out very recently and uh, my other more prolific uh, guests have uh, uh, other books as well. So I am Camper English. I am a drink writer. I've been writing about cocktails and spirits exclusively for more than 15 years now. I ended up, I started doing sort of like reviews of bars uh, and stuff and then the cocktail renaissance gained momentum and then there was tons to write about as far as what was happening and why it was happening uh, early on. Uh, eventually I sort of specialized more in the science and technology of cocktails and spirits. That's, I like getting really geeky about that because my background was in physics in, in college. And I sort of ran with that thread and I ended up writing for some places like uh, Popular Science and I did some stories for Savor and uh, I kind of do a combination of uh, trend stuff and a lot of book reviews. I, I do love the drink books. I got a couple of them back there and uh, and then the sciencey stuff. And I write a lot about ice cubes, um, which if you're familiar with my work, is it's a lot about ice cubes. So that's me. So uh, Amanda, why don't you take it away? All right. Um, well, actually, I'm having something, you know, with the kind of ice cubes that you like, the nice, clear ones. Um, so uh, I'm Amanda Schuster. I am based in New York City, where I mostly kind of kept my career um, mostly like central to New York. But I, I, I came up through the wine world. Um, and so 
I call myself by spiritual because I have, I actually have a full sommelier training in wine. And then through working at Astor Wine and Spirits, I became their assistant spirits buyer and kind of entered that realm there. And this was around 2007. And, um, and then I, I, the, the world kind of crashed in 2008, the first time. Um, and at that time it was, it was a good opportunity to, you know, to take my love of writing and, and to take the knowledge that I'd gained on the floor at Astor and also working at Morel and, and, you know, start, start writing. And I just kind of, it was a really good time to do it. It is, you know, Camper mentioned it was the cocktail Renaissance. And so, you know, getting in on at the sort of, it was already kind of had already started, but sort of getting in on sort of the, the end of the beginning, let's say. And uh, I've been working at it ever since I was the editor in chief of alcohol professor for eight years. Um, and right now I'm kind of just exclusively writing books and doing a bit of stuff behind the scenes. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, uh, Emma, go for it. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Emma Jansen. Um, I've been writing about drinks for about 12 years. Um, I started at the daily newspaper in Austin, Texas, where I covered the drinks beat there. Um, bars, cocktails, beer, that kind of stuff. And then uh, freelanced for a bit after moving to Chicago. Um, again, kind of like with a broad net, all kinds of drinks um, before working as the digital editor at Imbibe Magazine for um, the last seven years or so. Um, and I left the magazine at the beginning of the year. And so I'm just freelance again, um, doing um, mostly articles about agave, uh, which kind of came back to me after leaving the magazine um, I do a little bit of photography and, uh, of course, the book stuff. Um, and really, I'm, I'm trying to just kind of narrow my focus now that I'm uh, not having to write about all of the drinks all of the time. Um, narrowing my focus to more of spirits and cocktails and bars that um, have a really distinct sense of place um, is what I'm the most interested in. And so um, that's kind of where I'm going to go from here, I think. Super, thank you. Okay, so now I figured for our next going around in, in a circle chat, we'll uh, talk about our our books and um, uh, we'll, we'll start with mine, uh, but I really only have one to talk about. So um, when, it, when it comes to Emma and Amanda, you're, you're welcome to talk about all of them, uh, go for it. I'm really curious as to the origin stories of books, I think is ends up being really interesting in almost every circumstance. And it's usually pretty unexpected, I, I think. So uh, my book, as mentioned, is Doctors and Distillers. It's the history of alcohol and medicine from ancient times through relatively modern times, although uh, the invention of penicillin pretty much made a lot of the booze-based remedies <laughs> unnecessary or showed their flaws. And th that book came about through a very sort of long process. I guess we, we could talk about it going back probably seven years or more. I was writing a story, more of a trend piece for Savour Magazine about the gin and tonic. And my editor kept asking for more background information, like why, why did it come about um, and take the form that it took. And in that process, I wanted to find a, to cite a creation date for the drink, or at least the first reference to it. And I hadn't really seen anything that was definitive by, by a long shot, just the vague idea that it was created in India. We knew that tonic water was a cure for malaria uh, and gin just traveled with the Brits. And so it was the Brits in India where the gin and tonic comes about, but not a first reference date. And so I thought I was gonna outsmart the system of drink writing because uh, drink writing tends to be a little bit loose on the historical facts. Um, you know, people are drinking at the time and memories are foggy. So I decided I was gonna find the answer, the first reference to the gin and tonic, and I was gonna find that in books about the history of malaria because the history of disease is really, really well documented unlike the history of booze. So I started reading books on malaria and there's a lot of great books on malaria. And when you talk about the history of that disease, you end up talking about the history of medicine for all time because malaria may have actually infected the dinosaurs. It's, it's, it's so old. And uh, in that process, I kept running into not just the use of quinine for malaria and um, the history of medicine and how it changed over the years, but running into alcohol at like every step of the way and its use in medicine and then medicine's impact on alcohol and, and vice versa. And so initially I had published after my 
first big run of looking at the gin and tonic exclusively a like a self-published little not really a zine but a, a little mini book on the gin and tonic history and it's kind of funny and i did little illustrations for it and that helped me get a lot of talks about the topic and in the meantime i was researching and pitched a book about not just this one drink but the global history of medicine and alcohol and then sort of the usual publishing process of putting together an outline and the samples and getting an agent and pitching it to uh, different publishers and i thought that maybe it would be published more like a textbook because it is kind of really detailed and, and researched with lots of pictures and a big hardcover thing. But instead, the format chosen was uh, it's just a soft cover, one with uh, almost no illustrations in it. So that's how that came about. It was just launched in uh, July of this year, so it's still shiny and new. And uh, that is the story of that. So um, why don't, uh, Amanda, well, we'll keep the same order. Why don't you take it away? Okay. So you want me to talk about New York, uh, drink like a local New York, my latest one? Um, or both. Yeah. Well, uh, drink like a local New York is my, is my second book. Um, it just came out. However, it was supposed to come out in 2020. Um, and then a thing happened to us all. Uh, I began researching it in, I was actually, so this is the second book that I've done with Cider Mill Press. Um, and uh, they pitched me to do this. And I, I was thinking, Ugh, do I really want to do another New York book? And then I thought about it and I was like, you know, if I don't do this book, someone else will. And that would just be wrong. And what I, and what I really wanted to do was to do exactly what I did was to show was to highlight the the bars that are not as well known. And what I was afraid of is that somebody else wrote this book. You you would be reading the same things that are already out there, that the things that about the places that everybody knows. And I wanted to challenge myself and challenge the reader and and really provide a guidebook that could be used. You know, if you come to New York City and you find yourself in an interesting neighborhood, this is where you could go. And um, so I really got out to all five boroughs. And, and so between December of 2019 and early March 2020, I covered a lot of ground. And there was a little bit more to do. And then the thing happened. And I asked my publisher, I said, you know, we, 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 can't, we can't put this book out. Not only am I afraid that a lot of these bars are not going to be here, but, you know, I was worried that we wouldn't be able to drink in bars ever again at all as many of us did. And um, it was put on pause and luckily science prevailed. And in 2021, we could pick it up again and unfortunately lost a few of the bits that I'd written for obvious reasons. And, and so, you know, I'd backtrack a bit, but also find new places. And I'm very glad I did. And I'm extremely happy with the 75 bars that I, that I feature in the book. I got David Wondrick to write the forward, which was really cool and, and extremely generous of him. Um, thank you, David. And if you're watching or at some point, or you hear about this um, and, and now um, in 2022, it's finally been published after uh, how many launch dates were we supposed to have? Four? It's actually out now. You can get it. Now, I, I was wondering, uh, do you have uh, an estimate of how many bars changed from your list, your sort of pre-pandemic list? It's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. I mean, I really thought it was going to be a bloodbath. And and luckily, and I'm really, really glad it wasn't. And I'm very proud of these places for prevailing under the circumstances that they had to, that they had to work under, you know, so many um, shifting ideas about public health. And in just in New York City alone, all of the different, you know, rules and regulations and curfews and whether or not you had to order a sandwich with, with your drink and, and how many drinks could you have without a sandwich and where could you sit and, and, you know, is there plexiglass? Is there not plexiglass? You know, do you take your temperature? I mean, all of these things. And, and so, so many bars jumped through all of these hoops and dealt with so many attitudes and, 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 and so many, and so many other um, conditions that I wouldn't, you know, wish on anybody and, and stayed open. And so I think I lost a good 15 out of the original 75, but I expected to lose a lot more. 
Well, I guess that's good news, bad news <laughs> in the case. I, I, I did like how uh, you sort of paid tribute to a lot of the, the lost bars of the pandemic. I thought that was a, a really lovely touch that you did in the book. And it um, just goes to show, I mean, I think the book radiates a love for bars and, and yeah. a love for bars of New York. And it's exactly like the cool spots that you would you would <laughs> want to hit that your cool friend knows about and no one else does, or at least right. nobody you know. So I I uh, am a huge fan of the book. I think it's Thank you. I think it's great. Now you had mentioned the your previous book, which is New York Cocktails yes. on the same publisher. Yes. Now um was that also a case where the publisher came to you with the concept and, and asked you to to write it? Yes. Um so uh, I was approached to write that book in um, January of 2017. And I finished it in March of 2017 because I was only given six weeks to write it. Woo! <laughs> but, but I did it. Wow. Yeah. That, is, that is fast. Um, <laughs> I'm like, my fingers hurt just thinking about <laughs> the, the, the typing. Um, now, one thing I'm, I'm thinking probably a lot of people don't know is that um, a lot of books that come out like these it may not have been the the author's idea, but a publisher's idea. Yeah. Um, like, I, I don't know if you, you're saying this as well as for other books that you're like, um, well, there's some books that come out with no author's name on it now, which is. Yeah, that's scary. Interesting. <laughs> no, it really um, does. That really hurts me. That that really that really tells you all you need to know. It, 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 it is a sign um, yeah. that uh, they didn't even put someone's name on it um, yeah. at the end. But um, I was approached at one point, um, maybe we all have, by a company who specializes in SEO chosen books. And uh, it was a, a situation in that we had to write it very fast and to get it on the market, to take um, advantage of the latest trend that was happening at the time. And uh, I didn't end up writing one of those, but um, I, th I thought that's an interesting aspect of publishing that probably a lot of people don't know or don't think about. Like, oh, everyone decided to do slow cooker cocktail uh, food books at the same time. Like, no, actually a robot chose that. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Amanda. So let's, uh, let's uh, go to Emma and learn a bit about how her books came about. Yeah, I mean, that is a good segue because Mescal also came to me. Um, I, it was not a book that I pitched. Um, going back to like the days when I was working at the newspaper, uh, Mezcal was one of the first spirits that really captured my attention. Um, and so it was actually like the first feature that I had printed in that newspaper um, in English and then in Spanish. And it's a spirit that I just kept up with over the years, you know, I was very interested in. Um, and then I wrote an article for him by um, about like, you know, the how many agave centric bars were opening in the US. Um, and that caught the attention of the publisher who had been mulling over this idea, um, you know, was curious whether or not it would be viable for a book. And when I looked around and I didn't see that many, um, you know, super thorough resources on the spirit, um, I was like, yeah, actually that's a really good idea and you should let me write it. And like somehow it worked. Um, so uh, yeah, the way that worked out um, was really good. But um, also like to your point, Amanda, that book, um, I had four months to write um, and people are always really surprised to hear that. And, and you know, I, I felt comfortable doing it because I had been following the spirit for a good like five, six years prior to that. Um, but I think there is also this like perception that if you write a book about something, you are that absolute expert, right? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the times, or at least in 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 the case of Mescal, it's like, well, I, you know, I'm I'm a reporter and I have a curiosity about this, and for that reason, I think you know I, that's the energy that I brought to the book. Um, it was um, you know a a, um, a journey to demystifying it. Um, because that's kind of what I do. Um, you know, you start with a question that you want to answer and then you pursue it. Um, so yeah, that came out in 2017. Um, and then um, that, I pitched a bunch of other ideas. Um, I suppose in retrospect, several of them very half-baked. I was just so excited to do another book. You know, I just really wanted to do another one. Um, and of course, none of them got picked up uh, And uh, until um, I was approached by 
uh, Julia Momose of Kumiko in Chicago, which is a, a, an incredible cocktail bar, um, kind of a hybrid Japanese American program. Um, Julia's from Japan and uh, Clarkson Potter had reached out to her about um, doing a book on Japanese cocktail culture. And uh, I had known Julia for years working with her, um, you know, through my position at Imbibe, um, I featured one of her cocktails in the Mezcal book. Uh, and so she thought of me and I was also based in Chicago where the bar is. And so uh, it made a lot of sense when we started in 2019 because uh, we could meet every week and, and, you know, do kind of this like super long interview process to kind of help her bring that book to life. Um, of course, uh, when 2020 happened, we definitely had to pivot on that front. And uh, luckily, we were kind of close to the finish line um, at that point. But um, it was definitely a, a crazy kind of, how do we do this? Um, you know, putting the pieces back together um, towards deadline. Um, and, of course, and then around the same time, actually, that um, Julie and I, there was a little bit of overlap um, another cocktail uh, bar in Chicago, the Violet Hour, um, which really started the whole cocktail thing in Chicago. Um, they had been working for years to get a book picked up. And uh, Toby Maloney, who's one of the partners of the bar and also, um, you know, comes from a, a fantastic cocktail lineage, um, you know, worked at Milk and Honey, worked at Pegu Club, worked at Flatiron. Um, so this was his book and, uh, I, he asked me, I was, uh, that one I had interviewed for that position. He'd interviewed three or four different people. Um, and we met at a cider bar in Chicago, not too far from where I was living and, uh, had several rounds of rosé, um, just really hit it off. And, uh, I guess that's why I ended up on that project, um, which, uh, that's the bartender's manifesto. And that one just recently came out this summer. That's the like really long story as short as I can get it for <laughs> to be digestible. <laughs> I would say, like as I said, the stories of how these come out are, I think, are some of the most interesting aspects of, of books. Yeah. And <clears throat> the uh, the minutia of publishing gets super weird. Um, but and we probably won't go so deep into that side of it um, unless people are, are all that interested. But um, yeah, just how um, books come about is probably not how most people think they they come about. So I had uh, a, yeah. some follow-up questions of based on stuff that you just said. First of all, you did the photography for Mezcal um, in that four yeah, months. I did. As well. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, were you, um, were you, were you um, just kidding. St studying that before? That, did you have a history? Yeah. You didn't just start doing photos for the book. <laughs> right. No, actually, yeah. I picked up a camera long before I started writing. Um, and multimedia was um, very much my thing um, starting, you know, very early in high school um, through college. I was actually a film major. Um, and that's how I got that job at the newspaper was I did video editing and audio editing. So um, I was an assistant at the paper, you know, shooting and editing uh, news and entertainment videos um, and then kind of segued into the writing thing, which is another thing that I'd always loved to do. But I never, ever thought it would be like a career, let alone lead to writing books, which I, I kind of always wanted to do. I just never thought would be something viable. You know what I mean? And um, so you, uh, you're you the only person who's worked with a, a co-author of, of the th three of us here. And that's uh, m must have been strange. I, I can't imagine uh, <laughs> that process and what it's like to sort of lose your voice and uh, keep the voice of, of other people. And I'm wondering, um, like, how is it how is it different with your your two bartender um, co-authors? Yeah. Oh man, they're so night and day. And, um, and that's for me why it was, it was so exciting and so wonderful um, to work with both of them. Um, you know, Julia is um, uh, such a, uh, her bar is so elegant and so um, understated and it's, it's beautiful. And, you, you know, like they had a, they had a Michelin star, right? So it's like this very upscale, um, and her writing and her storytelling is very lyrical. It's very um, transportive. It's very soft and beautiful. And so I would be kind of um, working to write in her voice and then 
and I did both of these books at the same time I was working for Imbibe. So like I would, I would write for Julia uh, and, and with her, you know, we would edit together. And then I'd switch to Imbibe. And this is all like in a given day, this would happen. I would switch to Imbibe, which was like this very neutral, oh, things are delicious kind of vibe. And then I'd go work with Toby, who is um, who is basically a punk rocker. Like it's like jumping into a mosh pit. And, um, you know, people have made fun of us for the number of fucks that we put in the book. There's like 45 or something. There are like 73 pages or I don't honestly, I lost track. Um, but he he's just... Um, He's such a good storyteller, but uh, his voice is so totally different. So um, yeah, some days I definitely felt like uh, like I had multiple personality disorder because I was like, who am I in all of this? And you know, and like um, truly, I think I wrote in other people's voices for so long that this year not being um, uh, being freelance again, it's it's actually been kind of a challenge to give back to. Uh, writing in my own style and and kind of rediscovering that for myself and reclaiming that. Um, but I love I love doing it all, um, and I really love co-authoring because it is this adventure of of getting so deep into someone else's brain, um, and and you know you feel like you're almost living their stories with them as they tell it to you because um, that is just like the world you live in their world for a while, and it's super super cool. Nice. That's that's fascinating. That's totally I would yeah. have thought it would have been like, oh, I've just got to twist my brain inside out and suffer to like lose my own voice. <laughs> but you make it sound like a, an adventure that <laughs> maybe I should try. Sometime. Yeah, <laughs> it was a fun challenge, a really fun challenge. And I think it honestly, it really did like strengthen my skills as a writer. I mean, it was not easy. There were definitely times where it was it was really challenging, um, but I'm I'm really grateful for it. Now, uh, yeah. that um, your um, co-authoring with sort of celebrity bartenders uh, led me to, to think of something that we might talk about is that um, getting a book deal, and this sort of is going to lead into a, a, a question that I see in the comments, but um, the process of getting a book deal, it can be um, someone comes to you with, with a concept because they know you are a writer in, in that category, or um, for a lot of other books, it can be based on reach and uh, and, and and celebrity. Um, do either of you want to address that? Yeah, like, actually, I have an experience with this. So the the two books that I have published were both I was both I was approached for, and the third book that I'm working on now also approached by a different publisher to work on. Um, but um, in between book one and two, there was a period of time where I was actually pitching a book around We I actually had got an agent and I was working on something with another person. I was going to be writing the book, this, this, I'm not going to say who it is, but this wife of a very famous person in the, in the spirits and cocktail industry who was known for her caricatures, let's put it that way. Um, we were going to write a book together and it was a really exciting concept and the, and the, the agent was all over it and we shopped it around everywhere. And there were so many titles out at the time, the market was so completely saturated. And then a publisher would say, I want her, but not her, you know, either one of us, it, it was, it was, it was, you know, it went both ways and they just didn't want to pay two people, you know, a fair amount of money to get this book published. And so it just never got off the ground. And it's really sad because it was a really cool book, but that it was, it was such, it was such a devastating process. Cause it just, it's, we were so, we were so exuberant about it. We were so excited that we found an agent so easily, you know, who was just, who was just so in love with the idea. And then the whole thing just completely disintegrated. I think we've all had, uh, <laughs> knowing you both, we've all had proposals that didn't sell. And yeah. that's, that also might be uh, a little bit unexpected for people who know, like, even if you're a relatively well-known writer in your field, it doesn't yeah. mean that your book is going to get published. Um, that said, I do think sort of your your reach, your audience, your number of followers on social media is probably the most important um, factor in getting a book deal. It's yeah. certainly... Um, it is taken into consideration in uh, a lot of different ways in the process of the deal. And you can sort of feel it happening when you, when you have your concept out there, like the problem might be the concept or the problem might be that you're not on TikTok. 
Yeah, that whole platform thing is very, is like, it's so real. And Camper, you and I have talked a lot about this. Like, it's so real, but it's also very like, it's, it's obscure, right? It's not a straightforward thing. Because you talk to some publishers and they're like, yeah, you have to have a huge social media following. And then other publishers are like, well, it's not necessarily about that. It's just that, like, you have to be known for the thing that you are pitching. So like, to the question that we had come up in the comments about like, would you recommend being published in places before pitching? Um, I mean, I would definitely say that is going to help your argument, right? That's going to help show to a publisher that you have a platform in that subject matter. Um, you know, after I finished co-authoring the last two books, um, they were with the same editor on the Clarkson Potter um, imprint. And um, I went to her with an idea and, and I thought, oh, you know, like, well, she said that like, she's really enjoyed working with me and that I'm really good at what I do and that she recommended me to anybody. And, and she was like, no, we can't take that. And I was like, okay, well, can you tell me why? And we had a long conversation and, and the takeaway that I walked away with was, well, you don't like, I, I don't have a platform. Like I don't have, I'm not famous enough to carry the book that I pitched right? Like I'm good enough to support celebrity bartenders, but that message was very much like, I don't have a platform in that area. So that's kind of why, and that happened last summer. And so that's kind of why like over the last year, I've been thinking, okay, if that's really the book that I want to write, how can I best set myself up to prove to a publisher that I'm the person to write it? And I do think like clips, um, articles, features, all of those things are, are at least, I would like to think are going to help. Um, in addition to, you know, that other mysterious percentage of it is like, is it social media following? Is it, I don't know, awards? Is it you being featured in articles? I don't, all of those things are, are too mysterious for me, but um, yeah. Right. That's, that sounds like a perfect answer to that question to me. Like uh, I am hundred percent on board with that. Um, so uh that brings it to another sort of question for general discussion as far as the types of books that are being published. So we've already talked about, for example, we we're going to talk about trends a bit, I guess, is this next segment, trends in uh, drink book publishing. Um, so we've heard um, Emma has two books by famous bartenders and famous bartender books are are quite big and have proven successful to, yeah. to like to be fair um that uh well-known bars might the, the title of the bar might be the title of the book death and company or yeah. smuggler's Cove, for example um or it might be the bartender who is sort of independent of of the bar who can have essentially their name be be the important part of it but I wondered if um, if you two had thought about sort of other what what are you seeing what what are, what are you seeing a lot of or more of uh, out there for books? I think in some ways it's it's going in a lot of different directions. There there are there are going to be more of these sort of marketing TM kind of books where it's it's a subject that you know. They're they're using SEO buzzwords and and they and they just need somebody to to write these really quickly or there's a publishing company that just wants a pretty coffee table book and they don't actually care what the words say. And there's but but I think there's also a really cool trend of people who do really care about the history and and want to to write a compilation about um, like one of the books I really I really like from the past couple of years is Girly Drinks. Um, what, what's uh, by Mallory O'Meara because because she kind of tells the story of women of women bartenders and their fame and their famous drinks and really kind of delves into you know into the the serious history of of women bartenders and I and I think books and I think there's going to be more books like that too um, that I'm that I'm hoping to see and and the other thing I want to say is this this thing about um, you know, star tender books. This is something that's been going on since the 1800s, right? I mean, if you really think about it, you know, bartenders manuals and Jerry Thomas and 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 all of these things. I and mean, those those are those are books that are about that bartender and the drinks that they make and like. They don't they don't you know talk about themselves in in detail and and discuss each one. It's really kind of a compendium of recipes, but you do get a sense of what you would be drinking if you're in that bar. And you know, and I and I think people are really interested in these in these bar stories now. 
Mm. You know what it's like to be in a certain place that you don't necessarily live in and can visit all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you, Amanda. And I like, um, you know, I think there, there has been discourse about, um, you know, like, do we really need another bar book, you know, a book from a bar or a book from a bartender. And I think there's room for so much more. I really do. Yep. Especially when, when there is like a specific perspective or, a, or an experience that hasn't been put to paper yet. Right. There, there are so like so many stories and so many perspectives um, that have yet to be told. And I, and plus, uh, you know, for bar specific books, I love the idea of like, being in love with a bar and, and having their recipes at home. So you can yeah. make them at home. If you don't, you know, well, whether you live there or not, I was going to say, cause I travel a lot. And so, um, you know, for example, like the um, cure in New Orleans has their book coming out um, this so fall and um, oh my God. And I got a sneak peek and it's so beautiful. And I know that like, I can't wait to get my hands on a hard copy because I'm going to use it all the time. Um, <laughs> not just because I love cure, but because like, there are times where I want that New Orleans vibe, right? When I'm at home. Yeah. And so I can open the book, I can put on a playlist, like you can create experiences around those for yourself at home. Mm-hmm. And then you also are strengthening your understanding of, of their program in that bar so that when you go visit again, it's going to be totally different experience for you. Like having been inside their head, so to speak, right? Like after yeah. reading a book. So yeah. I do, I do, um, I do hope that we see more of those, especially if they're adding something new to the conversation. Yeah. Right. Well, thanks. And uh, some other sort of topic trends that, that I've been seeing are, well, one, non-alcoholic cocktail books. And yeah, sure. um, the, the SEO has definitely reached them. Um, there, there are so, so many more coming out and um, just using a different incarnation of uh, non-alcoholic or spirit free or, or something like that. There's, there are a lot of those, but I, I mean, I think it's great. Um, yeah, especially since the category keeps updating itself, you know, the, a book that was written three years ago, there's going to be, there's so many more products now than there were yep. at the time. Yeah. And books on uh, aperitifs and spritzes um, mm-hmm. and, and low ABV that sort of all can touches each other, the, the, those three categories. I'm seeing more of that than the brown, bitter, and stirred cocktails of the of the first wave. Um, so that's, uh, mm-hmm. I think that's fun as well. And the return to fun, I suppose, is, yeah. is one. There's a return to simplicity, which um, is a bit of a race to have fewer ingredients and faster drinks uh, in, in book subjects but there's also the 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 fun drinks of uh john deberry's drink what you want i was going to bring that book up i love that book terrific terrifically fun book and um the 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 one from nightcap uh, do you guys remember yeah. the, the title of that book? Josh's book is beautiful yeah yeah um drink drink lightly. lightly thank you drink lightly by mm-hmm. uh, and uh that's uh it's really fun design it, it gives you the vibe of a fun bar and yeah. you, know, you want to like have a drink and go shopping. She talks about shopping for drink ingredients in it. And it seems so like into the same vibe of the book. I, I just really enjoyed those aspects of it. So uh, I wouldn't say less serious, but more fun. <laughs> yeah. books is, is well, another... Drinking is supposed to be fun. And I think for a while we were forgetting that the drink books were so serious and not, not just have academic the way you write about drinks camper but I mean in terms of like you can only have this thing this one way and that is the correct way and there's no other way and mm. you know and we're finally steering away from that yeah and we can drink vodka again apparently <laughs> right we've been <laughs> given permission by the New York Times to drink vodka and grenadine yes. um, thanks. <laughs> yay <laughs> <laughs> um now, one thing when, uh, so I get asked a lot about books, I'm, I'm assuming <laughs> we all do, um, because we get a lot and read a lot of them. But uh, when someone says to me, like, uh, what's, what's a good book on gin? I always have to say, okay, I need more information for that question, because there's not just books on gin. So books um, might cover different aspects of, of gin. And I was wondering... Um, uh, Emma, if you could uh, speak to sort of within a category, perhaps the category of mezcal, um, uh, what what are the the range of ways that people are talking about those in terms of books? 
Yeah, and you know, especially, and I'm gonna lump, um, I'm gonna lump mezcal and tequila together, and just like use the broader agave thing, since they are so um, cut from the same cloth. Um, but yeah, even within um, like a category of single spirit books, that's pretty small still, right? It's it's still pretty niche. Like that's probably gonna change with how um, that category is growing in sales in like explosive ways. But um, right now, yeah, there's still um you know a, a good amount of variety within that so like so like my book mezcal is very much like it's meant to be a 101 right it's meant to be like if you don't know anything about mezcal pick up this book it's got some history um it's it's got some facts and it's got um a bunch of recipes too right which are a really great gateway into that spirit um but then you have other books like um finding mezcal which is um written by ron cooper uh, who's the founder of Del Maguey and um, co-authored by Chantal Martineau. And um, that is very much like, it's a, it's a travelogue, right? It's the, it's the story of um, how he came to develop the brand Del Maguey. And um, even though it's, it's about him, really, um, I, it's still very interesting. And I think you can still learn a lot because he's taking you as the reader to all of these places that you don't have access to, right? Like they very few people have access to, and you get to learn about these families and the, the landscape. And, um, Chantal just does a, an absolutely fabulous job of, um, helping tell his story. Um, her first book, um, is also completely different. How the Gringos Stole Tequila, um, her book, and I would, I would pair that together with um, Sarah Bowen's book, which is called Divided Spirits. Um, both of those are more of like the socio-political approach, like very academic, like crammed full of incredible research. Um, you know, they can be a little dense if you're brand new to the category, but I still like, I still recommend them to everyone. Um, they were some of the first books that I picked up and it, it took me a long time to like figure out what was going on. But now that you can kind of pair all those together, like if you read all of them, you'd, you'd have a very well-rounded view of what that spirit is. Um, and of course there are, you know, there are other ones that are uh, more recipe driven too. Like if that's your bag, um, that's pretty easy to find. Um, any number of books that are like, well, here's just a load of recipes and there's nothing wrong with that either. And, and then I've also seen one just on the plants, like a, a little, um, yeah. uh, now one the very, cool. very like botanical view uh, of, mm -hmm. of mezcal, um, yeah. as well as, and I don't, I don't know if this really exists as of yet. The brands are changing so fast in the category, but there's a type of book that most categories have, bourbon and gin and rum, that's uh, 20 pages or so of history and introduction. And then the rest is uh, tasting notes uh, and information about specific brands and things mm -hmm. to recommend. So that's another type of book that we might find in a, a category that's become very, these are the common formats. So when people say, what's a, what's a gin book? Say, well, what do you want to know about? Do you want to know the history? Do you want to know production? Do you want to know uh, tasting notes? Do you want to make cocktails? Um, or or, or something to... about a very specific time as well, hmm. you know, just like a concentration yeah. on this one era. Absolutely. Totally. So uh, so that's that's the, uh, the the range of books that we get on, on any particular topic when it comes to spirits. Now, uh, when it comes to bars, we turn to our uh, bar expert, um, Amanda. Uh, I, and I, I hope you all can't hear. I don't know. Can you hear this bar in the background, by the way? Is no, it coming through? Oh, thank goodness, because um, I live I. My I share a yard with Lobo, this this bar in my neighborhood, and there are, there are a couple of people who I think are enjoying some mezcal at this moment, very loudly. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad they're not coming through. <laughs> no, you must have a good mic. We can't. I can't hear. Okay, anything. good. <laughs> um, so when when we think about bar books, like the world of reviewing venues or, or writing about them seems, you know, everything went to Yelp when it used to be the Michelin guide or, or whatnot. And uh, for to have done two books that are sort of feature bars, uh, I guess New York cocktails is more cocktails from bars, but um, uh, it, it's almost like it seems a little dangerous. And I guess you experienced some danger <laughs> in writing your book about yeah. bars that might not be there. Um, yeah. And so, uh, 
yeah, I mean, do we do we still need bar books? <laughs> this is obviously a loaded question. <laughs> That's the person who just came out with a bar book. But um. well, I mean, it depends on what kind of bar book, right? I mean, not to toot my own horn, but I think my book is pretty darn useful. I mean, because I mean, and it's also it's also shaped and weighted like something that you would carry around like you used to carry around the Zagat guide. Yeah. You know, it's right. It's very small. And the whole idea is that you can put it in your pocket. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and use it as a guidebook. It's meant to be an actual guidebook. Um, and so and, you know, so I think for that kind of that kind of purpose, it, it you know, it can be quite useful if you don't know New York very well or find yourself in a neighborhood that you don't know, you can, and you have the book with you, like, oh, this is where I should go. And that is, that's the whole idea. Um, but in terms of bar books, yes, because I, because, I mean, I don't live in, in London, I wish I did. And, you know, so I love reading about London bars and, and bars in San Francisco and, and Chicago and, and other places because I'm not there very often. And so I like to be able to sort of feel that experience from, from where I am in New York. I think, I think it's, I think they can be very transportive and interesting, you know, depending. Yeah, so I guess their its value might not always be in a guide to bars, like you're right. going to go to them, but like a visit to bars to yeah. learn learn about them. Um, Especially recently, you know if you're stuck at home, it's it's a nice it's a nice way to do a little bit of traveling. I recently read the book um, Cocktails of Asia, which is about the more of the high end fancy cocktail bars uh, all, all throughout. Asia by the editor of uh, Drink Magazine in Asia. And it's sort of like, it's definitely a segment of, of bars that very much has uh, no overlap with the type of bars Amanda wrote about, <laughs> but it's the, the, the hotel bars and stuff. But they had a lot of pictures of the bar and the bartender and, and then the drink in, in the bar setting. And as a, like, I'm probably not gonna get to go to 90% of the bars. And I enjoyed it for just that reason mm -hmm. that you were talking about as, um, as a, as a visit to the bar um, to see oh, what they're doing. Yeah. One of my favorite books of all time is The Speakeasies of 1932 by Al Hirschfeld. And he takes you, he takes you on a little journey through New York City dur during Prohibition and, and, you know, with a, with instructions on how to sneak into each bar, you know, and, and be able to be able to order a drink there and, and, you know, a caricature of what, of the bartender and, and an overview of what they're able to serve, what they're able to get their their hands on and serve you during prohibition. And this is the end of prohibition, where it's kind of like the the where we are now in the pandemic, where you know we're not wearing masks anymore, and there's there's no secret passwords. You just kind of walk into a place because it's kind of over, but <laughs> but not but but not really. And so, but it's this really but it's this really great snapshot of what life was like drinking in bars at that time and a lot of them are gone or, or, you know, obviously we don't, we don't live that way anymore, but it's still fascinating to read. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Even if the bars are, might be closed or, or, you know, you pick up that book um, 50 years from now, like your book, Amanda, like someone will pick up your book 50 years from now and be like, Oh, that's what New York was like at the, at that time. <laughs> it's a time capsule like that. Very that's true. cool. So like, I think it's, it would be easy to say that like these guidebooks don't have lasting power, but, um, but they are that snapshot. Right. And like a vivid yeah. one of, and you can extrapolate all sorts of things about culture just by, by looking at the bars. So I think yeah. that for that reason, it, it, they are super cool. Thanks. Um, I think, uh, let's, let's take, uh, another question. Cause I, I, I think it's interesting and also might be, um, a little bit unexpected rather than me talking about history books, which is um, what I was going to talk about. But um, uh, so I had another question. Uh, do, did you start each of your books with a specific reader in mind? And if so, how much of that was dictated or directed by the publisher? Or did the vision of the reader change as you wrote? Um, I guess I'll, I'll, from my perspective, um, I'll say that um, the, the reader I wanted to lure in to the book, and this is more like sort of selling the book, uh, tells you who your reader is because who you're going to sort of want to buy it. You've got to sell them uh, your, your book. So I wanted to be people who are interested in medicine, people who are interested in science and the history of science, as well as drink people who I feel I'm most familiar with. So I, I did some specific things in the book to try to reach 
further into those uh, audiences. Like I have a chapter called science and it's about the impact of, of drinks on science. And that was very purposefully done. Um, and uh, the format of the book also dictated a lot of how I wanted to talk to a reader. Had it been um, sold as a hardcover book with a lot of images, then I would have been telling the same facts in a very different way. And I could let the images do some of the talking for, for me and um, to have a, sort of a different format that's less narrative, less, you know, five paragraph sections in a row and, and shorter ones that that would have changed. And it's, it's a bit about the reader, but I found the, the format dictated a lot of how I approach the, like, I know it's going to be a paperback book, therefore I can't do all these lists. Um, I had some in my first version that I wrote and bullet points and things like that that just don't look good in pa a paperback book. So I wrote around that and tried to approach it and a way for the format so that the reader didn't have a, a weird um, paperback book with all these um, marks, uh, editing marks in it. Do um, you guys want to respond to this as well? I mean, I the books that I write about New York City, I write them for people who aren't from New York. I try to I try to describe the place as much as possible for to somebody who who doesn't experience it every day. Um, I also write it, and but also in a way, I also write it for New York as well. You know, paying paying tribute to you know as a native New Yorker and and loving the city and and wanting to do it justice. I kind of try to find that balance too. But yeah, for the most part, my reader, I envision somebody who's not from here. That makes a lot of sense. I think with with mezcal, I definitely had a clear reader in mind, um, and it was someone who knows absolutely nothing about the spirit, probably hasn't been to Mexico. Um, and so for that reason, I worked in, you know, a, a couple of like personal experiences of my reporting when I was there, but not to make it about me, but like to just contextualize and kind of like, like ideally have them be reading it and putting themselves in my shoes as they're reading it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, the publisher didn't, the publisher did not, I don't, I, he didn't really um, have input on that one. Um, you know, with the Bartender's Manifesto, we also had a very clear audience for us in mind, um, which was uh, not 101, right? So the, so very much like a 201, um, hmm. like a doctorate and not like a, you know, <laughs> a bachelor's degree. Um, and for that reason, we start off the book with saying, literally being very explicit, this is not a 101 book. Um, if you're just getting into cocktails, go read these five other books and then come back to this book. Um, and that gave us liberty to be more nerdy, um, be a little bit more, um, to not have to over explain things. Um, with that one, there was a, there was a lot of back and forth with our editor because um, my, as a, I don't know, maybe a gross generalization, but like editors at larger publishing houses want to have as large an audience as they can, right? They want to make as many sales as they can. And so they they definitely want things to be um, more accessible uh, for folks. Um, but I think we managed, so we did have to shift a little bit and I think we did end up hitting like a good balance between those things. So that if you are not, uh, you know, Toby with 25 years of experience, um, we wrote it in a way where we're bringing people into his world not like with enthusiasm and not as like a snobby, well, if you don't know this, then you shouldn't read this kind of thing. So it, we did have to eventually strike a balance. Thank you. Yeah. Um, now let's do, we have, um, have a little more than five minutes left or so. Let's do a semi-speed round, not that speedy because it's too late for that. But um, <laughs> like, I want to talk about some of our, our favorite books, the books that we like and, and, and talk about and um, sort of a, a recommendation. Um, but before we do that, let's first do a round on what are the type of books that you most look forward to reading when you see them come out and be like, oh, I can't wait to read that. So in my case, it's anything sciencey um, and anything on, on production, why something tastes the way it does because of something somebody did to it. So that's, that's my jam in general. Uh, Emma, you wanna go next? 
Yeah, sure. Um, I like, um, I really do like narrative driven stuff um, that, it, that is, is really transportive and that dives really, really deep into um, a place or a, a person or a thing. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, 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 the books that I'm most excited about, I mean, I'm really excited about that Cure book because, you know, it's such a story and it's such a, it's such a, um, you know, being in New Orleans and, and the way that bar came up and how it's like, you know, one of the first really modern cocktail bars in, in New Orleans. And so, I, yeah, I look forward to stories like that these days. I don't know if there's so much about history anymore that they can you can really delve up, but there must be something <laughs> as I look forward to those as well. <laughs> yeah, I think like history books that are revealing layers that haven't been told yet. I think absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, not just the same, the same perspective, the same story that's like right. kind of been told over and over again. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's one thing I particularly enjoyed about Bartender's Manifesto is that it's like, like, you know how to do all this stuff. Like, here's how to think about how to do this stuff is, is what is really additive of that book that just shines in it. And uh, it's what made me really like it because I, mm -hmm. I too have read all of um, like, oh, it's recipes from, from famous bars. Like, okay, um, I got it. And like, then... I'll refer to that. But <laughs> the book I enjoy reading <laughs> is a book with a little bit more, more than uh, recipes in it. Um, well, why don't we take a, an audience question just because because um, uh, we can. Um, <laughs> uh, the question is, what do you do? can you describe a daily ritual you take to help get in the creative mind space to help you write? I'm kind of interested in Emma's answer to this because she had to get in other people's mind space. <laughs> I'll yeah. say for myself, like I, I write for a living. I, I get up and I go to the computer and, uh, and start doing stuff. Maybe today I'm have to write first thing in the morning, or maybe I have to send a thousand emails, which was today. Um, but I don't, I don't have any ritual or whatever. It's, uh, I mean, it's not just a job by by any means, but I, I go to work, I, <laughs> and, and I work. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. I'll go. Um, I'm, I'm very similar. Yeah. I. Um, uh, almost to a fault, like I get up and I go straight to the computer and I, and I try to get all of my hard writing done first before I let the rest of the world in. Um, because then I find that it's very easy to get distracted and it's very hard to get back into the zone. Um, on the days, I do have a little bit of a ritual though. So like, especially with books, um, oh, I feel like I'm so nerdy about to say this. Um, so it, especially cause it's so easy to procrastinate. Um, and, and like I said, like get distracted and stuff. So when I'm having a hard time getting into a vibe, um, I will like, I'll take a break. Like I'll get up, I'll stretch. Um, I will light a candle. Um, I've for all the different books that I've written. I have a different candle, like a different smell. Like the one from Kumiko, um, was, is actually like, it's the, um, what's it called? Brooklyn Candle Studio. It's the Kyoto candle because that's the one Julia has at the bar. And so I used to smell it every week. And so kind of uh, having that smell is, is this weird sensory thing. And then like, I'll have a playlist too. So I'll put on the playlist, I'll put on the candle and I, and I feel like I've done it enough times with, an, with each project that it, it does trigger something in my brain that says, okay, it's cool. Like let everything else go and now you can focus. Um, it's just kind of like a five minute thing where I just kind of like get centered and um, now it, it, it works. Like I've done it enough that I find it to be really helpful. I actually find that I'm the most productive if I play for about 10 minutes before I really have to sit down. So like I now have a ritual of all of these online games that I play. Like I, I do a few rounds of, of boggle with friends and I, you know, hurdle and wordle and, Duran Duran hurdle and like, I just get all of that out of the way. Like I almost feel like that's part of my job is that I have to do those things first and then I can get in the headspace to, to think academically and, 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 you know, deal with what I have to deal with for, for the writing that I do. I love that. That's fun. That's a more fun, like a more fun way of like tricking your brain. Right. Like, yeah, I have yeah. to, cause I have to switch off and then switch on again. It's yeah. like rebooting. Yeah, yeah. I, do, I do that at night to get to sleep. I have to play solitaire on yeah. my phone to like not think about everything, to think right. about yeah. this one little easy thing that I can solve and I can solitaire win. Solitaire is for the afternoon. 
Ah. <laughs> um, yeah, and I and I do I did find myself like made myself a cheesiest drum and bass soundtrack to like motivate me for writing. It has nothing nice. to do with writing about vintage liquor and medicine, but awesome. it got the job done. And it was just on repeat, like probably 12 songs that are very like emotive drum and bass. <laughs> really, it would be really embarrassing. I'll share it with you sometime. <laughs> soundtrack <laughs> of songs. No, I love it. Um, we are, well, just at the one hour time point that we just hit. So um, that means it's time for us to wrap it up. Um, so I guess I'll do our, our outro. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, um, uh, folks who asked questions of us. We appreciate that. And that was uh, fun to think about and answer those questions. Mm. And um, uh, so tune in. Uh, check the Beverage website to see what the forthcoming talks are. I, I saw some by Lou Bryson uh scheduled and he's delightful to to listen to um and uh so i'm sure you will enjoy those and uh, those are scheduled for wednesdays at about the same time sl slot and uh check out beverage for for the tasting kits and upcoming live events and uh thank you to my co-panelists emma and amanda uh, it's it's always nice to see you uh, outside of twitter <laughs> and um yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, I look forward to everybody's next books, um, which I know are we're all scheming or in the works or writing or somewhere in that process. So uh, everyone else, you'll just have to stay tuned. Uh, thanks for joining us. And, and uh, we'll see if our live chat ends. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we'll just be waving into the window. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.